So um, are we ready to ready to go, Lucy, then? I need to uh, give a 10 second warning, but I just wanted to make sure you all were ready before I um, Okay. Is everybody ready? Do we have everybody on board? Looks like it. Excellent. Okay, 10 second warning. And then um, if we could start, I will go through um, and just have each person um, identify that they are here um, once we've started. Okay. I'm not sure if I get anything more. Give me the nod when we're ready. I, I can't see anything that says, so I'm going to assume that we're all set. Okay. All right, then. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our June 16th uh, Development Commission meeting. Um, before we get started, we will um, do a roll call on who is here with us this evening. So, Lucy, I'll let you go through the list. So, um, as I read your name, just indicate your presence, please. Michael Brennan. I'm here. Richard Sanford. Here. Richard Soa. I'm present. Patty Dillon. Here. Brooke Shore. Here. Kevin Price. Here. Arthur Schulte. Here. Johnny Kada. Here. Mel Melvin Morgan. Here. Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, the major topic on the agenda tonight is training for the commission on kind of the legal framework that we operate in. Um, but before we get to that, we have a couple of um, administrative things to cover. Meeting minutes, uh, the first from our November 18th, 2020, they were included with the agenda materials. Uh, does anybody have any amendments uh, to the meeting minutes from the November 18th meeting? No. Seeing none, then we will uh, adopt those by consensus. Uh, the second is our May 19th, 2021, our last meeting. Those minutes also included with the agenda materials. Any uh, changes or edits to those meeting minutes? No. Seeing none, um, those minutes are also adopted by consensus. So. Uh, that takes care of our administrative responsibilities. I think we'll hand it over to uh, Lucy Sloman. I think you take uh, lead on the training for this evening. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, tonight, uh, we are doing a training on uh, Open Meetings Act, uh, uh, public records <laughs> requests, quasi-judicial permits, and some of the permits that the Commission reviews. Um, to uh, lead the meeting, uh, this portion of the meeting, I'm handing it over to um, almost Chief of Staff, Tina Evers. Thank you. Um, give me a moment to share my screen here and get ready. I will be in a limited view, so I'll rely on uh, Chair and your staff liaison to help pause if that's appropriate. Uh, throughout the meeting. And it looks to be functioning as I had hoped. <laughs> so, thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I'm Tina Akers. I'm your current city clerk. And uh, first, I really want to thank you for your valuable service to the community. Um, I know that Issaquah is a great place to live and work. And uh, I've been uh, in local government for 25 plus years. Uh, with 17 of those here in Issaquah. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to um, provide this training and know that you have resources at hand through the clerk's office and through the city attorney um, outside of this meeting for if additional training is warranted or if you have further questions. Joining me this evening is our city attorney, Mr. Haney, and I'll give him an opportunity now to say hello and introduce himself. Thank you, Tina. Um, I'm Jim Haney. I am the city attorney for the city of Issaquah. Uh, as uh, Tina said, she's got 25 years of experience uh, as a municipal clerk. I've been acting as a city attorney for 40 years. So uh, been around a little while, uh, have a little bit of experience and hopefully can help you uh, this evening with some training. So uh, as Tina said, I appreciate your service to the city. 
I know it's uh, not easy sacrificing all of the evenings that you sacrifice, all of the weekends that you take to read packets and so forth. And I always marvel at uh, your willingness to do that um, as volunteers. And so uh, just really appreciate that and uh, happy to sh be sharing another training with Tina this evening. Thanks. Uh, so um, here's a list of some of the things that we'll cover. Uh, I won't uh, list them all off, but um, hopefully we'll hit the mark on, uh, on these items. So the first part of this presentation covers uh, some important state laws relevant to your service as commissioner. And then the second half will cover specific processes of your commission. So let's start with the sun, excuse me, the sunshine laws, often referred to as the Open Government Training Act. This is relevant to the service uh, that you do as a commissioner. This training is mandated by state law and consists of three elements. It's the Open Public Meetings Act, public records, and records management. Uh, why is this mandated? Well, the intent of the training is to increase your knowledge of the laws and responsibilities of jurisdictions and those who perform the various duties, whether it be staff, council, or appointed officials as, uh, like yourself. The state auditor's office is looking to reduce findings and decrease violations, and the cities are looking to reduce risk. The auditor's office often found, or when they do find that violations are made, that they're not malicious or intentional, the violations simply resulted in insufficient training or knowledge. So this act is intended to foster open government, education, and reduce liability. So OPMA, most of you are familiar with this phrase, is the Open Public Meetings Act. It means that meetings are open from start to finish, oftentimes referred to as gavel to gavel. The idea being that the public has the right to attend and observe the decision-making process. For in-person meetings, this means having an accessible meeting space that is open to the public. However, at this time, meetings are held virtually, and that means that we are publishing call-in information and um, providing proper notice for that attendance. Um, your meetings are also recorded and live streamed on the YouTube channel and Channel 21. For all meetings, advance notice to the public is required. Uh, there are some exemptions where the meeting may be closed to the public, but those are very rare. And uh, I do have one slide on it um, that we can talk about a bit later. Uh, we want to ensure that you are operating within the OPMA and, again, within the spirit of being open and transparent. You have two types of meetings. Uh, it's either going to be a regular meeting or a special meeting. And your meetings fall, uh, to my knowledge, on the second and fourth Thursday, uh, excuse me, when, or first and third Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, Traditionally in the council chambers, although we are in the virtual world, um, if the governor's orders change, then we will ensure that we are uh, meeting uh, state law and providing whatever proper notice and uh, situation that we, that we need to adhere to. Uh, special meetings are those meetings that fall outside of your regular meeting schedule. So whether it's the date, time, uh, or location, uh, it can be any of those factors. And uh, that is when we refer to it as a special meeting. Special meetings may also include other uh, types of meetings, uh, community conference, work sessions, workshops, retreats. Um, regardless of the format, uh, all these meetings must include an agenda, must have minutes. Uh, they must be posted and distributed in advance. State law says that we have at least 24 hours before the meeting to do that, but of course, we want to ensure that you are well versed on what's in the packet, and we, and we certainly want the public to be aware. So we strive for five days or more uh, to ensure that you have that, uh, those materials. Uh, state law does not require public comment as part of um, uh, meetings, but uh, we value it, and we do include it as part of the agenda. Uh, later on the agenda, we'll, we will talk about the more formal elements uh, where public hearings are required. So uh, with OPMA and meetings, 
Uh, I did mention a sort of closed session. Those are referred to executive sessions, and uh, they're very few. Um, uh, council, boards, or commissions may only use this closed portion of the meeting for things that are identified in state law, and it's for discussion only. No action can take place, meaning uh, you can't decide and you can't certainly not take final action on something. Any Anytime that a motion is warranted, that would need to occur and properly be noticed in an open meeting. So you might see our city council go into an executive session for purposes of talking about property acquisitions or discussing litigation. If we were to find that your board warranted such a conversation, we would the staff would be working with the uh, city clerk's office and the city attorney to ensure that it was handled properly and that your conversations were limited to uh, the sole purpose of that uh, session. So OPMA, um, uh, uh, because of the size of your board, four members constitute a quorum. Uh, therefore, uh, we need to be very careful on when you are gathering together. Uh, you certainly can travel and gather um, for a non-board events, uh, social gatherings, so long as you are not discussing uh, the business of the board. Uh, state law defines the um, action as very, very broad. So whether you are taking public testimony, whether you're deliberating, discussing, considering, reviewing, evaluation, um, or taking final action, all of those things uh, need to be open and transparent and uh, be at a meeting that's been properly noticed. Um, we want you to be mindful of a quorum, whether it is done um, uh, through a series of, of emails or in person or a combination of that or over several days. Um, it, you certainly can share information, but any moment that you start discussing, um, this is the area that we want to keep you out of. We want to ensure that you're saving your discussions for the meetings and we uh, urge you to work with your staff liaison um, if you are trying to um, get information to your other commissioners. And then I'll just pause and ask our city attorney if he wanted to provide any comments. Uh, in our past conversations, you did bring up a really good point about a school district um, uh, violations uh, in another jurisdiction that that is, is Good for us to be mindful of. Yes, thank you, Tina. Um, the the example, uh, the case that uh, uh, gives us the rule regarding email and serial types of meetings is a case that involved the battleground school district. And the school board in that particular case uh, was considering the performance of the superintendent. Uh, the uh, school board members emailed each other over the course of several days discussing that performance. So they weren't all together in a room. Um, the emails were not simultaneous. They occurred over a, a, a period of days, but throughout that period of days, Ultimately, there was a quorum of the commissioners who were actually emailing and discussing the issue with each other. And according to the court, that was a meeting. And because it was um, a, a meeting, it was subject to the Open Meetings Act. And you, the commissioners, or excuse me, the uh, board members uh, violated the act by not holding that meeting in public. And so this is something just to keep in mind as you, as you look at this, that a meeting has a broader meaning under the Open Public Meetings Act than simply what we would traditionally consider a, a meeting. Now, after, during the pandemic, since we've all had these virtual meetings, it may be different, but we used to always just think, well, a meeting is when we all sit down together and talk about something and we, for, we would be in the same room. But uh, under the, Battleground School District case, no, it, you don't need to be in the same room. You don't need to be having the discussion at the same time. As long as there is a discussion and you're trying to uh, 
uh, reach a decision regarding something, that will be a meeting and it needs to be done in public. Thank you. Um, um, so be mindful of Tina, email. Yes. Tina, may I, um, we didn't really d discuss uh, how commissioners can ask questions if they have them during your presentation. Would you like them to uh, put something in the chat and I call your attention to it or hold their questions to the end? What's your preference? Um, I think we can, I think there's room for a few questions to be asked, and uh, I do want to be mindful of the entire presentation, but yes, if there's questions that uh, pop up, let me know. Um, so while we're waiting to see if there are, I'll just uh, reiterate that really be mindful of email, and the safest option to forward information is through your staff liaison, and if you receive information through the board, do not reply all with your perspective. Um, that, that again, would be in violation, and uh, the best thing to do is to uh, communicate the business at an open public meeting. Thank you. Um, there aren't any messages at this time, but I would say to commissioners in the lower right-hand corner, there is a chat button. If you click on that, um, you can then uh, enter, uh, make sure it says to everyone or to me and uh, just indicate that you have a comment or a question, and um, then you will be given an opportunity to voice that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this slide might do that. So uh, this is um, the penalty slide. So, um, you know, OPMA laws have been around since, you know, 1970 or 71, and um, they take this so serious that, um, if you're knownly violating OPMA, uh, with it comes um, liability and penalties. Um, so I will um, say that that uh, state law sets these penalties. Um, city liability is high as well. That would include court costs and attorney fees. And ultimately, the action that the board uh, would have taken uh, could be considered null and void. Um, basically, we want to establish a culture of compliance, ensure that the OPMA rules are followed, and that best practices and training are conducted like we're doing here. And uh, I'm sure our city attorney can um, echo some of those comments or speak to the individual liability component. Thank you, Tina. Um, yes, the liability, uh, there's a couple of consequences of violating the Open Meetings Act. Uh, the first, and I'll, I'll talk about the one that's at the bottom of the screen, which is that whatever action you take when you're not complying with the Open Meetings Act is null and void. So when the Development Commission makes a decision on a permit, for example, uh, and uh, if you did made that decision outside of the public meeting or you had that discussion outside of the public meeting, the action that you would ultimately take would be the action would be null and void that you took in violation of the Open Meetings Act, and you'd have to come back and do it over again in an open public meeting. So that's one reason not to violate the act. Um, a second thing that, as Tina pointed out, there is individual liability, and the OPMA is very specific that the liability is that of the individual board member or council member who is violating the OPMA. It is not, this is not the city's liability and the city can't pay these fines for you or these penalties for you if in fact you violate. And the penalties are $500 for the first violation and $1,000 uh, for any subsequent violations. So it's important for your personal finances not to violate the OPMA. And lastly, as Tina pointed out, the city can be sued for violations of the OPMA. And if, the, if an individual proves that in fact a violation occurred, not only will the court declare the action null and void, but it will award the uh, uh, petitioner's costs and attorney's fees. So the city ends up paying for any costs and attorney's fees that are incurred by the individual who sues the city. So all good reasons not to violate the OPMA. I'll turn it back over to Tina. Thank you. 
So another part of the uh, mandated training is public is the Public Records Act. And um, uh, under this, this is housed in the Revised Code of Washington. We also have it uh, adopted under our own ISQA Municipal Code. Uh, it states that as your city clerk, I'm your designated public records officer. Um, basically, the public has a right to uh, access public records and they have a right to receive those within a reasonable time. Um, I, you should know that uh, our email system is set up at this time to capture all incoming and outgoing messages. So uh, your staff liaisons uh, would be the first person I would go to if I had a, a records request that was related to the work that was in front of this commission. And, and then depending on how the records request was drafted, uh, we, we might need to work with you and um, walk you through search parameters and how to uh, secure those records and, and deliver them over to the city. So uh, what I can tell you is, let me check my notes here. Um, so yes, uh, you have an, a legal obligation to search for records if we've been asked. Um, you have an obligation to hold those records and not purge them. And you have an obligation to, to work with me to turn them over. And, and this is really important. Um, most likely we would hand you um, an affidavit or ask you for an email that uh, you would reply to and say, uh, I've conducted the search that you asked for. I've determined whether I do or don't have records. And then uh, that piece of information I would keep on file or uh, work with you to transfer the information. Um, it's really important that the city is deciding which records are disclosable and not individuals. Uh, this is important because uh, if we were going to exclude something, there are very few exemptions and then the state requires us to um, either redact the information or produce a, um, a redaction log or exemption log. So we want to make sure that all those steps are handled properly. Uh, so it doesn't occur very often, but when we do, um, here's some tips that might help you. Uh, being organized is one of them as, as your appointed position. You might uh, prefer and we urge you to stick to one email account as you are doing this business of the commission. Uh, keep track of your records. And if you take notes, which you, which you can, um, we suggest that you delete them when they're no longer needed to you personally. However, if you have them at the time that a records request has been um, initiated and we have informed you um, not to, um, of that request, uh, you can no longer uh, dispose of it because we would be having an active request. Uh, we do not want you using text messaging. Uh, it's a tool that, uh, while convenient, is not conducive to, um, hard to locate, <laughs> it's hard to transfer, and um, we want to ensure that, that the work that you're doing um, is funneled through Lucy uh, to the best of our ability. Tina, if I can just uh, comment um, for a moment, um, just two comments. One is uh, I would really stress that you need to be careful about using a dedicated account for your city correspondence, whether you have a city email address or you set up a separate email address uh, for your city business. It's really imperative that you do that and not mix it with your personal business. It just makes it so much easier for you to do the search in the, if we need to uh, have you do a search of your email and it avoids us uh, having to defend something saying that you were using your personal email for city business. So now uh, the other side gets to ask for your personal email as well and have your personal email inspected. So I can't stress that enough. Please, please do that. Second is you've probably seen in the news over the last um, several days about text messages because Mayor Durkin 
um, uh, in Seattle and uh, some of the Seattle police staff. Uh, apparently, Mayor Durkin's email, or excuse me, phone that she used to make text was set uh, to delete messages every so often. And they were not backed up on a city system. And the city is now going to be sued uh, for violation of the Public Records Act. Uh, those records were requested. They're not available. They were deleted. Um, and uh, there is going to, to be that. So that's one reason why we we strongly suggest you not use text messages because it is very hard to retrieve them. Um, so we prefer email and things like that where we can actually obtain the records if we need to. And you need to be careful that those records are preserved and not deleted. Uh, and unless the city clerk tells you through uh, a records retention schedule that you can actually delete those. There's actually a, uh, the state specifies uh, how long you have to keep certain records. So the city clerk can advise you um, uh, how long and whether it's safe to delete something. Back to you, Tina. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, the city does have a code of ethics and uh, it's located at issaquawa.gov slash ethics. It addresses things like conflicts of interest, gifts and gratuities, political activity. Uh, it also reiterates the importance of the open public meetings and your obligation regarding public records. Uh, if you have, uh, I imagine most of you have one on file. Um, it, it stays on file for the duration of your term. And if you have new members, that this sounds like a, 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 a new <laughs> uh, form that they haven't seen yet, uh, please look at that and please get that on file. If you have questions about the policy or the examples that are provided, please let us know. And I'll ask Jim uh, if there's anything you wanted to reiterate. Um, I know that this is uh, uh, state law um, uh, references to conflicts of interest, gifts and gratuities, and political activity. Yes, uh, the city's ethics code is based on state law, but it does go a little bit further than state law. And um, I think the things to keep in mind are, in terms of conflict of interest, there are things that are pretty common sense, like you can't use city equipment or facilities for your personal use. Um, you, you can't um, uh, disclose confidential information that you gain as part of your uh, uh, duties. You can't hold a, posi uh, a position uh, in any other uh, business that conflicts with your ability to perform your duties as a development uh, commission member. And I would think that in those circumstances, the one where you might encounter that is if you were a local developer, for example, and had a significant number of permits in front of the development commission uh, during the course of a year, the likelihood is that you'd be uh, stepping down from your position on the development commission all the time. And that would, conf so that seems to conflict with your duties. Um, as far as political activity, the one question that that I sometimes get asked is, you know, sometimes um, board and commission members may be running for another office, uh, and uh, you know, you might want to run for a council opening, you might want to run for state representative, something like that. The only thing to represent to remember is that you cannot use city facilities in any way to uh, facilitate your campaign. And that includes wearing campaign buttons on the dais while you're or having campaign uh, materials on the dais when you are uh, acting as a development commissioner. I have had situations before where council members have wanted to, not in Issaquah, but in some of my other clients who have wanted to wear their campaign buttons uh, 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 as they get TV time. Um, and uh, the answer is no, you can't do that. That would be campaigning and using the city's facilities. So um, I think the rest is pretty straightforward. Gifts and gratuities is, uh, 
very straightforward. Um, you just can't accept gifts that are given to you because of your status as a development commission member. If a gift is given to the city, um, someone brings in a, a box of, of chocolates or something like that and wants to, uh, wants to give it, uh, you can certainly uh, put it out for people to, uh, to take. If gifts are given to you, say, as part of a sister city's trip that you might be on or something like that, uh, you can accept those, but those are the city's, not yours. Um, and there are some times when you can accept a discount that is provided, but it can't be a discount that is provided only because you are a city official. Um, and so recently I was asked a question. There is a, one of my clients has a um, contract with Microsoft that um, provides that all employees get a discount on Microsoft products. Um, but while that does benefit the city employees, it's also provided to every other large uh, employer who uh, purchases a certain number of licenses from Microsoft. So it was not, it's not a benefit that accrues because they're city employees. It's a benefit that accrues because their employer is a large public employer. So um, that is a, that's an example of one thing that, that can be done. So that's all I have to say, Tina, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to move forward to the, our next section, which is the role of members. And so I'm going to cover um, these four things on the slide, attendance, role of alternates, meeting materials, and then uh, just ensuring that you're abiding by your code of ethics. So attendance is important. Um, you know, we need a quorum to have these meetings. Uh, and when we schedule and we plan, it's really important. Um, there's costs associated with scheduling these meetings uh, with staff, uh, with noticing a meeting and our public hearings. So it's really important that um, the meetings that we're planning for, that we know that we'll have a quorum who can do the, do the work and do the business of the commission. So it is helpful and it is important that you let your staff liaison know when those absences um, are occurring. And uh, we like to have advance notice uh, when possible. We know that's not always the case. Um, but failure to notify uh, the city of your absence will be noted as an ex unexcused. And that's important because if you have consecutive unexcused absences, it does jeopardize your uh, place on the commission. And, um, and you know, ultimately, if it just came down to your ability to have time to serve on the board, um, most likely you would be talking with us anyway about um, uh, possibly your need to be stepping down or resigning. So we just want to make sure that we're well planned and that uh, we're using our time well. I wanted to talk about the role of alternates. Um, really important that we fill the board to its fullest extent possible, meaning um, alternates serve in the absence of a regular member. Uh, we are working to reach the quorum of the commission, and we want to fill all the voting seats. So it's not just to reach the minimum. Um, and, and there's ways to, to determine uh, which alternates uh, can, can serve in that regular seat. Uh, it could be first to arrive. It could be uh, figured out in advance. Um, it, 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 so long as you're providing an, an opportunity for uh, that to be shared over time. Um, so, again, I just really want to reiterate that we're looking for the fullest extent possible. So it's very possible that um, all your alternates are serving in a voting role at a regular meeting if those seats were open. Uh, meeting agendas, they're provided by email. They're posted online. Uh, we, we strive to get those to you well in advance. Uh, that's so that you can come prepared. Um, so. Uh, we imagine that you're setting time aside, you're reading the materials, um, you know what's on the agenda and what's in the packet. 
and that you are uh, talking with your staff liaison in advance um, uh, when needed. Uh, you'll have some indicators on your agenda to indicate uh, sort of the status, uh, what staff is looking for from you. Uh, so if something has the icon of, or the symbol of I, it's informational um, discussion items. And then if, if they are seeking action, you'll see the, the big A there. Um, obviously, you're going to have discussion as part of action, and clearly you can also have discussion as part of information. Uh, we're not trying to um, provide uh, every symbol possible on there, but uh, it really will help guide you if action is warranted. Uh, this is just a... Uh, Tina, can yeah. I jump in? I'm sorry. Uh, a couple of slides ago, this is Mel Morgan. Um, a couple slides ago on the alternates, uh, it said participate in discussion but not in debate. How do you how do you distinguish between discussion Certainly. and debate? If there's a motion on the floor, that would be debate. Okay, so anything That's, after a motion's been made. Right, uh, because alternates, if they're not serving in a voting seat, cannot make a motion, can't vote on it, so they shouldn't be party to the debate of it. And I would say that's the, the clearest element there. We are doing uh, some chair training on the 22nd, and uh, we'll, that's one of the items that we'll be covering that, that can be helpful. Thank you. Sure. And then uh, this is not necessarily your, well, it is. It does look like a screenshot of, uh, of a past agenda. <laughs> and again, this is, uh, I think from, from an April meeting, and it just reiterates that uh, you have the packet available in many forms. Uh, you can view it as a PDF, you can view it as a split screen, um, and we hope that offering it in several formats is of use to you. Meeting procedures. Uh, I'll just talk through some of these um, gently. <laughs> This isn't meant to be your parliamentary training. Um, but when a motion is made, the first one is considered your main motion. It's your motion that is uh, your proposal to do something. Uh, it must be seconded. If it's not seconded, it's not a motion, and the meeting moves on until uh, another motion is made and has been seconded. It is useful to have motions in writing, and in our virtual world, um, there are a few times when uh, the clerks will say, yes, it's okay to use chat. Um, you know, you're using chat to sort of raise your hand. You're not putting in um, content of how you feel about a topic or what your question is. You're just saying question, comment. And in this case, if somebody had the motion uh, in writing, they could place it in the chat just so that it could be uh, reread or understood by everyone. You could also share your screen in a way where the motion could be on the virtual board, so to speak. Um, really what we want is the motion to be clear and everyone to understand what, what it is. And there's an example of one. Move on. Once an item has been um, seconded, that is the opportunity to debate and discuss that particular motion that's on the floor. Um, members are provided equal footing when it comes to the privileges, obligations of debate and decision making. So um, uh, the chair's role is to ensure that um, it's equitable. And so uh, some of those styles can be around Robin style. It could be um, you can't speak twice until um, everyone has an opportunity to speak first. You could also limit the time of the discussion um, by a time frame, like a set number of minutes. But really, we find the round robin style um, has, has worked nicely. Uh, what you don't want is that back and forth dialogue. It really isn't appropriate. You want to be able to um, have the chair uh, recognize people, and uh, you want your voice to be heard. And again, we're going to have some chair training, so uh, we look forward to uh, providing more on this topic. And of course, comments should be germane to the motion. 
And again, it needs to be equitable. Uh, before the main motion is voted on, uh, would be the time for an amendment to that motion to be made. So um, that occurs after the main motion. It also must be seconded um, before it's uh, voted on. So again, it's helpful to have in writing. Uh, if anyone's unclear about what it is, you can pause. You can ask. You can ask for it to be restated. You can ask for it to be put in writing. Um, we really want to ensure that you understand um, what is in front of you and what you're voting on. Um, again, debate uh, should be limited to the subject of that amendment and not on the main motion or on other elements that are to be considered. And you can only amend so far. So um, again, we don't want to over parliament, but we uh, certainly want you to understand uh, the basics and be comfortable in that world. Uh, I'm not going to go over this particular example. We use this one for a different board and commission. Um, traditionally, it's you know you're you're making a recommendation on a on a project, and then you might amend it, amend your recommendation to include additional elements, and then you would be voting on the additional item. And then if it was um, passed, then you would then be going back to the main motion that incorporated that change. And you have another opportunity to uh, vote. And uh, for alternates, if you're unsure what your role is, just ask. <laughs> we want you to be comfortable in understanding uh, those elements. If the meeting needs to pause for a moment to uh, confer with the staff liaison and ensure that you're on the right path, that's fine. Uh, we really don't have a mechanism for um, saying, I abstain. Uh, you're here as an as a appointed official to uh, have an opinion and to um, read your materials and to uh, take a vote. So uh, unless there's a conflict of interest or some other reason that you need to be um, uh, out of the meeting, uh, it, we expect you to be voting. And uh, if you say that you're abstaining, then it counts as a yes vote. And um, I'm not sure how many folks are aware of that, but uh, I wanted to bring that to your attention. It is a rule of, uh, of our city council and it is a rule within your bylaws. If you have concerns about conflict of interest, you can always work uh, with our city attorney to determine if it's valid. And then there are also, when you get into more serious public hearings and quasi-items, there's more form formal processes that you must walk through um, that allow someone the right to, to declare um, or object. And then with voting in your virtual world, uh, we want to do it by roll call. If uh, Once we return back to a real room and you're present, uh, you can do it by, by voice um, and show of hands. Uh, but right now, we're doing it by roll call. And then really, once a vote is taken, the recommendation of the majority um, must be honored. Uh, for public hearing processes, it, the typical format is that you have a presentation. It could be from staff. It could be from the applicant. Uh, you are provided an opportunity to have questions and answers. This isn't your debate, but it's really just to, to seek clarification on what you heard. And then once the hearing is formally opened and the public comments are heard, heard, at that point, which that has concluded, the commission needs to decide, are you declaring it closed? Or might you want to hear more information from the community and keep it open? So once an item is closed, uh, you can uh, deliberate and recommend. Uh, you can also Maybe you don't have your deliberations concluded or a recommendation to that you're ready to vote on. Um, so that deliberation can be carried over to a future meeting. But if you've already closed your hearing, that portion of the hearing stays closed. Let me move on. 
And this is uh, halfway through the presentation, so I will gladly hand it over to our city attorney. And I am happy to um, move through the slides at the pace. Uh, just let me know. And I'm going to mute now. Or if I can ask, nope, I can do it. Here we go. Thank you, Tina. Um, I'm going to cover public hearings and legislative decisions. Um, public hearings, well, I'm actually going to cover public hearings for both permit type decisions and legislative decisions. Um, but, uh, and then I'm going to cover uh, some potential liability issues. So next slide, Tina. There are two types of public hearings. There are legislative public hearings where the object is to get the public's input on policy issues that may come before the commission or uh, the council. And I realize that the commission doesn't do a lot probably of legislative work. The uh, commission's work is mostly relating to permits and quasi-judicial matters, but there may be occasions on which the council could ask you for uh, your opinion to review something and give input on a on a legislative issue. So when you're acting as a legislative on a legislative issue, your object and you're holding a public hearing, your object is to obtain public input on policy. When you're acting on quasi-judicial matters where you are conducting a public hearing on a development permit, the object is, is to decide the legal rights of specifically identified parties. You're trying to decide, does the applicant meet the criteria here to be able to develop the property and should they be granted the permit? You're also trying to decide whether the public comment that you receive from other individuals tells you that they shouldn't be granted the permit or maybe provide you information that reinforces that they should. So a quasi-judicial hearing is really to determine an individual permit or permit right. Next slide, Tina. Um, just to highlight again, because I don't know that you, you do a lot of these, but in legislative hearings, people are acting like, like boards and commissions are acting like legislators. The council does this often. The uh, Planning Policy Commission does this often. Um, and they're looking at whether the issues or the uh, they're looking at things that affect the community as a whole, as opposed to that affect an individual property or the people who surround that property. So in legislative matters, there is a requirement for public notice for the hearing uh, to lay out what the, uh, what the hearing is about uh, and uh, to uh, say that with enough specificity so people can have a meaningful opportunity to be heard. Next slide, Tina. Again, in a legislative hearing, you're just looking uh, at allowing all members of the public to speak. Uh, you can establish reasonable rules in a legislative hearing, uh, such as relevance, time limit. Uh, often there are uh, four minute or five minute time limits to people to speak. You can establish decorum rules and so forth. It's not a free for all, it's not a an entirely First Amendment proceeding where anybody gets to say anything for as long as they want. So, um, but it's important in a legislative hearing to state the ground rules uh, by the chair at the outset of the hearing so that everybody gets a chance to participate meaningfully and know what uh, the uh, rules are. Next slide, Tina. In legislative hearings, uh, we do have a set of criteria in the city code for each type of legislative matter, comprehensive plan amendments, uh, development uh, regulation amendments, rezones. Those are all those all have decision criteria set uh, by code or statute. In the absence of uh, set criteria on legislative matters, it's simply a policy judgment. And as you're going to see in a moment, that's not the case with respect to quasi judicial matters. Um, in legislative hearings as well, um, the, the body is not limited to consider the, to just the testimony and documents that are presented at the hearing. And that's in, contest, in contrast to a, uh, a quasi-judicial public hearing on a permit where you have to make the decision based on the evidence 
that is presented to you and cannot go outside that evidence to uh, come up with a different rationale or a different evidence that supports a decision. So it's a big distinction between legislative hearings and quasi-judicial hearings. Legislative hearings, you can listen to whatever you want and make the decision on whatever basis you want. In quasi-judicial hearings, you're limited to the evidence that is presented before you. Next slide, Tina. Uh, as I said, in quasi-judicial decisions, you're acting like a court. That's really what distinguishes a quasi-judicial decision or a permitting action uh, from a legislative decision. You're acting like a court. You're not acting like a legislator. And what courts do is if they hold hearings or trials to gather evidence so that they can make a decision based on that evidence. And that's what you do in a quasi-judicial process. You look at it as we're gathering the evidence which we need in order to determine whether this permit application should be granted based on the criteria in the code. So you make findings ultimately based on the evidence. You say, uh, well, this is what the application is about. This is how big it is. This is what its traffic impacts are and so forth. And then you apply the permit criteria to those facts to draw conclusions as to whether the permit should be granted. And again, you're deciding the rights of the applicant to develop its property. You're deciding the rights of others, individuals who may be affected by that development. And that's what makes it a quasi-judicial proceeding. Next slide, Tina. For quasi-judicial decisions, you should have standing rules of procedure. Uh, in the absence of standing rules, it is important to work out that procedure in advance and to announce the procedure at the outset of or prior to the hearing. Uh, typically, the party with the burden of proof presents first. Uh, in most development applications that you'll see, I assume we see a staff presentation first, and then we may see an applicant presentation. And the reason why we have the applicant make a specific presentation is because it is the applicant's burden of proof ultimately to show that their application meets the criteria in the code. It's not the city's burden to show that. It's not the uh, burden of the uh, people who may oppose uh, the, the, the permit to show that it doesn't meet the code. The applicant bears the burden of showing that it meets the code and that its permit should be granted. So they usually in a uh, quasi-digital matter, they get the chance to go up front and make their case. And then sometimes they, but not always, they get the chance to make a rebuttal. After all the public testimony is in and somebody says, uh, you know, a, a number of people have testified, maybe in opposition to the project, the applicant sometimes gets the chance to come back or the staff gets the chance to come back and say, okay, this is how we respond to those comments. Um, commissioners can ask questions at any time in a quasi-judicial hearing. Uh, it is important that you get your questions answered and it's important that you get your questions answered on the record before the hearing is closed. So you wanna make sure you've asked all your questions before you close the hearing. Because again, we're limited in a quasi-judicial matter to deciding the case based on the evidence that is produced in the public hearing. And that includes the responses to your questions. Next uh, slide, Tina. One of the things that separates um, quasi-judicial hearings from legislative hearings is a doctrine called the appearance of fairness. And I know you've been through this a million times. Lucy, I'm sure at the outset of every public hearing goes through the appearance of fairness with you. So you've probably heard about it as no, ad nauseum, but I'll just give you a couple of perspectives that I have. Um, first of all, note that it is the appearance of fairness. The appearance of fairness doctrine, it's not the fairness doctrine. It's not enough that you actually are fair. You must, your decision must appear to be fair to a reasonably disinterested person. The standard is, would a reasonably 
with a reasonable disinterested person, someone who has no interest in the proceedings, personal interest, would they, knowing everything about your background as it relates to this particular uh, application or project, believe that you might not be fair? And again, might not be fair. It's not whether you actually are fair or whether you can actually be fair. It's whether a reasonable person might have the, the uh, occasion to question whether you would be fair based on your background. And the focus, as it says here, is on the decision maker's relationship with persons affected by the decision or whether you're affected by the decision yourself. So um, next slide, Tina. There are a number of questions that get asked, and I know these are uh, probably familiar to you because I'm sure Lucy asks them all the time. But the first question is, do you have a personal interest, financial or otherwise, in the matter such that you stand to gain or lose by the decision? And an example I like to use is, will the traffic from the proposal go by your house and create congestion on the street that you live on? or create a safety hazard on the street that you live on. You have a personal interest in your property value. You have a personal interest in making sure that your environment is safe and is not congested. So you do have an interest in that, in that circumstance that could uh, be a, an appearance of fairness interest. Second, will, be there, will there be prospective employment for the decision maker or his or her family as a result of the decision? And I know that one sounds kind of out there, but it's based on an actual case example where uh, a person uh, who was on a border commission uh, voted for the, um, for the permit and then immediately took a job with the permit applicant. <laughs> and under those circumstances, the court said that even though the person was on the board was not employed by the by the applicant at the time that they heard this, they did have prospective employment with them and that created an appearance of fairness problem. Um, it may also be the case where, as the third question says, is there any business competition between the decision maker and any of the parties at the hearing? For example, um, is the permit before you to build a uh, uh, structure for a commercial business and you own a business that is in competition with that business, that would create an appearance of fairness problem. Someone would think you might not be able to treat the application fairly. Next slide, Tina. You also have to look at familiar relationships. So it's not just your involvement with the proceeding, but if you have a close family member who is involved, say your son or daughter works for the company uh, that um, uh, it has the uh, application before you, that would create an appearance of fairness issue. Or if they worked for someone who was opposing the application, that also could create an issue. Do you own or control property near the subject property? And again, that's a matter of, is this development that you have before you going to possibly have an effect on the property that you own, uh, that would create an appearance of fairness issue. Um, have you made a final decision on the request before hearing any testimony or evidence? That's a lot of actual unfairness, but you have to be careful, you know, that actual bias is does violate the appearance of fairness uh, doctrine as well. So if you're out there and you say, it, and you say, I would never approve this development, and this development, you, you know, will occur over my dead body, and then it, the development gets applied for, you're going to have an appearance of fairness problem. So uh, that's one to keep in mind is to just be careful uh, under those circumstances. Um, the last question here on this slide is, have any ex parte contacts occurred? And an ex parte contact is a contact that you have with someone outside of the public hearing. And as I said at the outset, you have to decide the permit application 
based on the evidence that is presented at the hearing. So the question is, have, have people provided you with information outside of the hearing that you may in fact, uh, um, that you may in fact take into account in the proceeding and therefore might not be fair. And I think if you think about it, you know, um, it's pretty simple. If you were uh, appearing before a judge, you would want to know that the judge had not had conversations outside of the courtroom with people who were on the other side of the issue. Um, that would tell you that the judge might not be fair and that wouldn't be a fair proceeding. So you want to be careful about having ex parte communications and contacts about uh, uh, an application while that application is pending. And I want to stress that while the application is pending before you. You know, if you had discussions with people before the application was filed, um, that's not an issue. But if you have contacts with people about the application, when the application is pending before you and will come before you, that is going to create a problem. Next slide, Tina. There is a way to cure those ex parte contacts. Um, you can do that by disclosing the substance of those comments at the outset of the hearing and giving the parties an opportunity to address them. And the theory there is that you just, you say, well, you know, I was in the grocery store uh, and, uh, you know, person X approached me and said, I can't believe that the Development Commission would ever grant this permit. You shouldn't grant it because, and you, it, it happens so fast that you can't tell them, you know, stop. That is not necessarily going to disqualify you because you can come into the hearing and at the outset of the hearing, tell that story. When Lucy asks you, have there been any ex parte contacts, you can tell that story and say, yeah, um, I had some, this person came in and this is what they said to me. And that gives the applicant and anyone else who might be interested the opportunity to get up during the hearing and rebut those comments or address those comments. And so that cures the appearance of fairness issue. Um, but that's the only one that gets cured by that kind of disclosure just by disclosing it. If you disclose there, uh, an ex parte contact, someone cannot challenge you based on appearance of fairness if you have disclosed your ex parte contacts. Other appearance of fairness problems can only be cured through disclosure and the lack of objection. And so at the outset of the hearing, when Lucy asks the questions, if you disclose that you, yes, I own property within 300 feet of this project and I got public notice of the hearing, and I just, I'm putting that on the record. If nobody objects to your further participation, they have waived any objection to it and you can continue to participate without worrying about the appearance of fairness doctrine. One tip I always suggest, and I haven't attended enough of your hearings to know if Lucy does this or staff does this, but is just for either uh, staff or the attorney, if we're there or the chair, to say after all the disclosures are made, does anyone have any objection to any of the commissioners continuing to sit and hear this matter? And if there's dead silence out there, then I suggest you say, I have heard no objections and therefore uh, the hearing will continue with all commissioners um, acting. And that's just to make sure that when we have a transcript later, and when if we ever get into an appeal, and I'll talk about appeals later, if we ever get into an appeal, we have a clear record that says the chair asked for objections, no one made an objection, everybody was given an opportunity, nobody objected, and so the appearance of fairness challenges were waived. Um, go, let's go to the next slide, Tina. Um, Quasi-digital uh, decision making, um, once you have finished with the hearing, um, deliberations can occur right after the hearing. I know sometimes you're tired after having a 
long hearing or you want to think about the testimony that you've heard uh, before you start your deliberations, that's fine. You can either have your deliberations right after the hearing closes or you could set them over to a subsequent date. The, thing to rem the two things to remember with that are that first, as I said, you need to ask all of your questions in the hearing. So if you think you may have additional questions, I suggest you don't close the hearing and, uh, and you continue the hearing to the next date in case you wanna ask questions. But if you are sure that you've, uh, you've asked all your questions and maybe you start your deliberations, but you say, now I'm just getting too tired and I wanna continue it over, then your deliberations can be continued to another date. Uh, as I said before, the decision in quasi-judicial decisions must be based on the criteria in the code. And each permit has criteria in the code, as you know, uh, and your decision is going to have to address each of those criteria as you make a, a decision. And if you find that the application meets all of the criteria, you approve it. If you find that the application does not meet the criteria, either you condition it so that it does, or you uh, deny the, the permit. Um, also, as I said, the decision has to be based on the record. That is the testimony and comment presented at the hearing and the documents and exhibits that were submitted. You can't go do your own investigation um, and uh, come up with additional evidence. You have to base things based on what you've heard at the hearing. Next slide, Tina. Um, Jim, before you uh, move on, um, there's a point that often comes up on the previous slide. Thank you for going back. Uh, related to the point you've just made about doing your own research. Um, some commissioners have asked about whether they can visit the site. And um, I think that might be a good point just to um, touch on for a moment, if you would. Sure. The answer is yes, but, a great attorney's answer, right? Yes, but. Um, the, when you think about, again, this is like a trial. And sometimes in courts, courts take juries out to sites to look at the site. And what the court does is it gives the jury an instruction. And I think this is the kind of inst instruction you should have is that what you see at the site is not evidence. The only reason you go to the site is to be able to help you understand the evidence. So for example, if you were having trouble visualizing how the site laid out based on the testimony and you wanted to understand it, you might you could go to the site and take a look and see. And that, that would be, OK, what I'm doing is I'm using this visual cue to tell me what the evidence means. But let's say, on the other hand, you go out to the site, and I had this actually happen in, <laughs> in a hearing that I was in. You go out to the site, and you investigate, and you think that there, you think you've seen a wetland on the site. And you come back, and you say, you, you say, okay, I was out to the site and I saw a wetland on there. So I think we need to condition or we need to deny the permit based on the fact that there is a wetland. And if there's no other testimony in the record, you're relying on testimony, you're relying on evidence to make your decision and you're relying on something that is not part of the record. So you can go to the site for certain reasons, but not for others. And you just need to be careful about it. Um, Any further questions on that, or should I move on? Actually, just a quick follow-up on that. So if you go out to, to a site to get a lay of the land and you think you see something that looks like a wetland, could you ask during the hearing whether there was a wetland investigation conducted? Yes, if the, if the, um, if the hearing is open, still open, you can say to, you can say, look, I went out and and looked at the site or heck, Issaquah is not a huge, not huge enough where most of you haven't been through 
various parts of Issaquah, you've probably seen most sites just driving by them. And you say, look, I'm familiar with this site. I think there's something here. Can you address this issue? And then you give them an opportunity to do it. And you, then when they, when they address the issue in the hearing and say, yes, we did a wetland evaluation. Yes, this was not a wetland based on the evaluation that we did. Then you can rely on that evidence. You're not relying on what you saw at the site as the evidence. You're relying on what evidence you got at the hearing. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, we'll move on. Um, I'll just cover this very briefly. Um, in legislative matters, when you're dealing with development regulations, those can be appealed to the Growth Management Hearings Board. Uh, the Growth Management Hearings Board uh, looks uh, is charged by statute with determining whether city development regulations and comprehensive plans meet the requirements of the Growth Management Act and the King County countywide planning policies. Um, so when there's a legislative matter that is decided, uh, development regulations, comprehensive plan changes, those kinds of appeals go to the Growth Management Hearings Board. Um, the Growth Management Hearings Board specifically does not have jurisdiction to consider permit appeals. And so those are handled under an entirely different process that we'll cover in a few moments called the Land Use Petition Act. Uh, and those go to court. But legislative matters um, relating to your development regulations and comprehensive plan go to the Growth Management uh, Hearings Board. Next slide, Tina. So there's some legal challenges that can be made to your decisions. Some of these apply to both legislative uh, matters and quasi judicial matters. Uh, a first uh, legal challenge that can be raised is procedural due process. Did you give the members of the public and the applicant adequate notice of the hearing and a meaningful opportunity to be heard? And that means that the notice has to say what the hearing is about so that a person can determine whether or not they want to testify and what and can prepare uh, to make their testimony. Now, some notices uh, will describe things generally and then provide a link to say a staff report or an application. And that's, that's fine to give that type of notice. But if you just said, we're going to hold a public hearing on development of XYZ parcel, and you didn't say what the permit was, you didn't say how any, and give any further really details about it, that would not be adequate notice because it would not tell people enough so that they could make a determination as to whether or not to testify. A procedural due process also means that procedures in the code need to be followed. The procedures are in there for a reason, and even though we're rewriting Title 18 as we speak, um, uh, and hopefully we'll make the procedures better, um, we need to follow the procedures that are in the code currently. Uh, or there is a potential for uh, decisions being invalidated on basis of procedural due process. Um, next slide. Substantive due process is really a legislative action, but it sometimes gets it's into quasi judicial things. The current state of the law on substantive due process is simply to say that the legislation, if it's a legislative action, must serve a legitimate public purpose and must not be arbitrary or irrational. Um, that's the current test used by the courts, whether something is arbitrary or irrational or whether it doesn't serve a legitimate public purpose. But again, most of your work is going to be quasi judicial. So um, there is less likelihood that substantive due process will come into play. Uh, next slide. And now the Land Use Petition Act. This is um, something which was uh, enacted by the legislature in the mid 1990s to govern how land use permits are appealed to courts and to um, uh, to establish a uniform process for that. Permit decisions that 
the city makes um, are appealable to the superior court under the land use petition act and the a land use petition act challenge must be brought within 21 days after the decision is made and is publicly available but the court has a limited review and it really in it really is deferential to uh, the decision makers, uh, not to an applicant or to opponents, but it's deferential to the decision makers because the act recognizes that you guys are in the trenches. You're the ones who heard all of the evidence. You're the ones who assessed the credibility of witnesses and the court is not going to overturn that unless it is a fairly egregious violation. So the court looks at six different things I've laid them out here. First is, was your decision supported by substantial evidence in the record? It doesn't have to be overwhelming evidence. It doesn't even have to be necessarily a preponderance of the evidence. It means that there is enough evidence in the record that supports the factual findings that you made to say that you carefully weighed the evidence and, you, and that there's evidence to support what you did. Second, the court looks at whether or not in making your decision, you made an erroneous interpretation of an ordinance or other law. And so they look at the criteria that you're looking at and say, did you interpret that criteria correctly or did you make some erroneous interpretation of it? Third, the court asks, was your decision based on a clearly erroneous application of the law to the facts. So it's it's again asking, did you have evidence? Did you have facts? Did you look at the criteria properly? And then did you apply them properly to the facts in order to arrive at a decision? Uh, fourth, it asks whether your decision had a procedural error. And the, the uh, Land Use Petition Act specifically says that there are procedural errors that are harmless, that don't affect the fact that the person got an opportunity to be heard and so forth. Maybe, maybe you missed some minor thing, but if there is a substantial procedural error that deprives somebody of their right to be heard, that is a concern for the court. Fifth, it's whether or not the decision was outside the jurisdiction of the decision maker. Um, that applies mostly probably to hearing examiner decisions, but um, in your case, there may be things that you decide which, you know, someone would say is not within the criteria or within the purview of the board to decide. That's the kind of, of challenge that could be made. And lastly, uh, the court looks at whether or not um, the decision violates the constitutional rights of a party. And that's where this substantive due process and procedural due process can come into play under the Land Use Petition Act. Review under the Land Use Petition Act is on the record. No new evidence is taken by the court. And I'll qualify that by saying that there is one circumstance under which the court may take new evidence and that I have seen. And that is if there is an allegation that uh, board members did not disclose sufficiently appearance of fairness issues that they had. And if someone says, I only found out about this after the hearing because this member of the board was actually employed by one of the parties and didn't disclose that, I only found out about it later. The court will allow the record to be supplemented with evidence so that it consider consider whether the appearance of fairness was, was violated. But in most cases, the court is limited to the record. What happens is that the hearing is transcribed uh, by the person who is appealing um, and all of the documents which were submitted to the evidence are compiled and all of that is submitted to the court. And then the court uh, uh, reviews briefing submitted by the parties and the court hears oral argument. And then ultimately the court decides whether any of these six standards that I laid out above have been violated. So 
that's how you challenge a development commission decision um, uh, or, rec or a decision of the city council based on a development commission uh, recommendation. Next slide. Well, I guess that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'll turn it back over to Tina uh, and see if she has anything additional to say uh, before we just open up to final questions. Thank you. It's, it's again, a pleasure to be here and uh, spend time with you. Uh, these topics are important. We want you to be comfortable uh, in the roles that you serve and know that you have resources um, and we are here to help. So uh, reach out if we can provide more information to you. Do any of the commissioners have questions before I do my brief part? Yes, I have a question. Uh, this is Richard Sanford. Uh, my question is about notes and records. Um, when we receive a packet from the staff and we review the packet, we you probably make notes regarding that before the meeting and during the meeting. We might make other notes on the packet or keep other notes. And I think the guidance was that we retain the notes for as long as we believe that we need them in our discretion. Certainly we would keep them probably through a decision, but do you have any guidance or criteria on how long we should keep our notes, uh, anything to help with that decision? I can speak to your general agenda items. Um, our attorney may have some other advice on um, items that um, uh, are more of the of pureness of fairness or quasi, but um, on advice from the state and the uh, records for boards and commission members, they can keep notes and dispose of notes once they are no longer of value or of service to them. So. Um, if you are in the habit of routinely disposing of those, that's fine. However, if you have them in your possession and, um, and they relate to an active public records request, uh, you will need to work with me to transfer those to the city. And the only thing I'd add is I think it's a bit of an open question as to how long you should, should keep them, uh, whether you should keep them. I certainly think you should keep them through the decision that you make. And I would recommend keeping them through the um, through the appeal period, which again is 21 days after the decision. But then at that point, if there's been no appeal and no, uh, um, no court proceeding pending, I think it's perfectly fine to get rid of them at that point. Okay, so decision plus 21 days, if no appeal, then it's fine. Yeah. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I will um, share my content and um, I just have a few slides. You, some of these will look familiar. Um, uh, just am more wanting to um, prepare commissioners um, for uh, some of the things that are um, coming up this year. So, um, partly I wanted to just touch on organizational structure. Um, it relates to some of the things that we'll be talking about tonight um, and that you'll be looking at in the future. Um, both staff um, and the Development Commission may make decisions and recommendations. So, uh, excuse uh, some... me, uh, Clerk Eger speaking. If um, I'm sorry, I don't have control to monitor the mics, but uh, there is an open mic that's causing some feedback. So if you um, are not speaking at this time, if you can please mute. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Um, so staff make decisions and recommendations. Sometimes our recommendations go directly to city council. That's typically related to legislative matters. 
Um, other times we are making, and more commonly for the current planners, making recommendations to the Development Commission. Likewise, uh, commissioners make decisions and sometimes you're making recommendations to council. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, when that occurs. Um, I'm going to go through some permits and processes and, and then you're welcome to ask questions at any time. Um, but uh, there'll be some things to discuss towards the end as well. So I'm not uh, tonight covering every kind of permit that you uh, cover, but um, these are three things that we're anticipating this year. Uh, one is site development permits, or SDPs. Um, that is a level three permit. Um, it becomes a level three permit um, depending on the size of the property, the size of the building, and or the street that it's located on. And typically, you're the decision maker, and it is a quasi-judicial permit. Uh, another kind of permit that comes to you is a master site plan. Um, it's a level five. It's triggered outside of central Issaquah on sites greater than 15 acres. Um, generally, master site plans are more conceptual. They may be a phased plan where um, certain elements are going to be built out over time. Uh, and you make a recommendation to council. And those are also quasi-judicial. Um, administrative site development permits are typically staff decisions. Um, however, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, they can come to the council. And if they, I mean the council or the commission, and if they do, they, they would also be quasi-judicial. So two uh, processes um, that relate to this are consolidation of permits um, and forwarding to a higher level. Uh, an applicant can submit multiple permits at the same time and ask to, ask to have them consolidated uh, under a single hearing and a single process. Um, most commonly, that is a master site plan and a site development permit that get consolidated and come to the commission. This is because a master site plan, as I said, is more conceptual. Um, you're still required to do an SDP or site development permit to implement the master site plan. So we frequently get the more detailed site development permit at the same time that an applicant, applicant is submitting a master site plan. And they, an applicant can ask consolidate those two kinds of permits. And then when you've consolidated a permit, it goes to the um, decision maker of the highest level. So even though you are the decision maker for a site development permit, if it's consolidated with a master site plan, the de uh, decision maker becomes the council. Um, the other uh, process that can come into play and that we're anticipating this year is when um, a permit is forwarded to a higher level of review. There are typically criteria, there are criteria in the code in general, and then sometimes there are specific ones around certain kinds of processes. Um, an example that you all have had um, was a, um, I think an amendment to a master site plan, um, and staff could make the decision, but um, it was also a uh, listed in code that that could be forwarded to the Development Commission, and that, in fact, was what staff chose to do. Uh, so an administrative site development, per, uh, administrative adjustment of standards, which is typically decided by staff, could be forwarded to the Development Commission and or consolidated with other permits and then come to either the Commission or the Council for a decision. That was a mouthful. Does anyone have any questions about this before I move on? So um, our review process, you've seen this before, but um, because we've gone through some of these pieces, I just want to touch on this again. Uh, we start with an informal phase, uh, which may be an introduction to the um, applicant between the city and the applicant and a collaboration meeting, which is a very informal discussion of the kinds of plans and making sure that they're using the right codes 
Um, then we get into the more structured reviews. Uh, one of those is what we call a pre-app meeting or a pre-application meeting. Um, there's a set of submittal requirements. Again, it is between staff and the applicant. Um, following that, we uh, have a sort of formal submittal of the full land use permit. Um, in this case, we're talking about site development or, and or master site plans at which time staff would prepare uh, a staff report. Um, then, uh, these, then this is kind of the process on, in which you're probably the most familiar. A staff report would be prepared, sent to the Development Commission. A uh, notice of decision or notice of recommendation would be issued. If it was a recommendation, it would go to the Council. And then, as our city attorney described, that might be appealed. Once the land use um, process has run its course, um, we get into the construction permits, construction, inspection, and occupancy. So um, this formal submittal of the permit and the preparation of a staff report are the immediate actions that then lead to the Development Commission um, the sort of key steps related to the Development Commission's work. Reviewing the staff report, holding your meetings, and uh, issuing your uh, decision or recommendation. So again, I'm going to stop. Um, that's the main things I wanted to describe about um, the Development Commission's um, process. Any questions? Uh, just a, a quick comment. So th this is uh, Mike Brennan. The um, as far as the public is concerned, they're provided a notice when the application is submitted. So they don't only get the notice about the hearing, the public hearing that we'll be holding at the commission, but they know well in advance that an application has been submitted to the city for a project. That's a great point, um, and we've been talking about this um, a lot. Um, I think uh, public notice is something that potentially will change under Title 18, um, because there is a lot of public interest, and we want to make sure people are aware of the project. For the kinds of things that come to you, uh, we are uh, doing a notice of application, uh, which goes to uh, property owners within a certain distance. Uh, we are then, when it gets closer to the public hearing, we are posting the site with a board so that people who um, uh, don't live within that distance or who just are interested in the area um, are aware of it. We um, have to um, advertise in the newspaper. It's, it's kind of the accepted uh, method, even though it seems kind of arcane. Uh, we are notifying any parties of record. So if people have commented somewhere in the process, uh, we let them know that this is taking the next step. Uh, we also have what we call an active projects map or active projects list. I'll show you this uh, in a minute in terms of resources. Once we receive a pre-application um, meeting packet, uh, we begin um, posting those materials to the active projects map or list um, because we want people to be aware of what's happening during this land use process because that's really the time for the public to be engaged, to comment, to give us their feedback, and um, to let the applicant know uh, what their thoughts and concerns are. Any more questions on this um, phase? Um, so a couple of things to look ahead to, um, and then I'll go through some resources. Um, the Title 18 um, Development Commissioner Commission is considered an essential stakeholder. Um, we have divided all the chapters of Title 18, which is the Land Use Code, into um, six buckets, um, and most of those are um, being uh, reviewed and uh, coordinated with uh, a commission who may have more information and more background. So 
the environmental board and PPC are working with one bucket. Uh, the parks board and PPC are working with another bucket. Development Commission has three buckets that we're um, in, wanting to engage you all in. One is zoning and uses, another is building design, and third is development standards. We see each of these having three sort of phases. The first is a gap analysis and policy and context discussion. Uh, we prepare a sort of background a memo on each of the chapters that will be before PPC and their partner commission um, and discuss that and um, pose certain questions that we see as being um, important things to get feedback on before we even begin preparing drafts. Um, then second, we will prepare a discussion draft. This is really where we want to engage both commissions and the public um, on uh, the, the draft that we've prepared in response to um, that gap analysis and policy document and uh, really uh, get a draft into really solid shape based on all the public uh, comment that we've heard. Then the third step, which will just be with PPC, is a hearing draft. So that's why it's struck out on here. Um, uh, DC would not be a part of that hearing draft um, because we're hoping that all the work that you've done in the first uh, two meetings um, will really build that knowledge base for PPC to then hold the hearing. And we're anticipating that um, the gap analysis work uh, for these three buckets will be happening uh, one each month uh, this fall. Um, we are uh, anticipating uh, upcoming, uh, we have, I'm aware of three permits that are in that would be coming to the Development Commission. Uh, one, we are tentatively scheduled in September, which is the Providence Height Master Site Plan and Site Development Permit. And we have a second potential meeting in case um, we need more than one evening to work our way through that. Um, this would be, um, as I described more generically, you making a recommendation to the council. Um, and then the third thing uh, is our communications to the commission. Um, the city is providing a little more consistent structure across all of the commissions and boards. Um, so one of the things that you are now seeing in your packet, I don't know if you've actually seen it, but I want to draw your attention to it, is a calendar of the year and uh, when, uh, what, what meetings we see coming up, uh, what meetings you may be interested in, topics that have not been scheduled like these other permits that we know have been submitted, um, but we haven't scheduled when they're coming to the uh, Development Commission. And because we don't necessarily meet with you every month, um, I um, have a tickler on my calendar to at the beginning of the month send you an email that's kind of like that calendar that would be a summary. If we don't have meetings in a month, I want to give you an update towards the beginning of the month. So I'm interested um, uh, if those, if you have any feedback for me on the emails and or the calendar that we've been sending, um, what, how, whether those are helpful, whether you have any suggestions on how they could better um, support your work. I'll just, this is uh, Mike Brennan again, real quick comment. So I, I actually really appreciate the emails. Um, I think the information provided is um, very clear. And as far as heads up, as far as when we're having meetings or if they're going to be canceled, because we all, you know, these days have pretty busy schedules. So it's nice to know in advance it, um, in case we have something else we're trying to balance commission meetings with. So. Um, I, I really appreciate the emails that, that you've been sending out, um, giving us heads up on different things. So uh, thanks for that. And, and just so you know that we will try and list specific dates of, we're showing all your meetings through the year. And if we have something tentatively scheduled, that calendar that comes in your packet will identify that. We have um, 
we're pretty close to finalizing the schedule for the Title 18 work. And so I will try and get those dates out, potentially even sending placeholder meeting, um, calendars, um, invites. I will try and not make them Teams meetings like I did tonight. That was an oopsie. Um, but just have a generic placeholder, um, and hopefully that will help you. Um, you know, since some of these are several months in advance, um, I, I know it's hard to keep track of all of that and want to try and help get them on your calendar um, so you're aware. Uh, because some of these, since these are with the Planning Policy Commission, these will be on Thursdays. So these are not going to be on your regular commission night. Um, so that's another reason to try and get these out um, early. Minnie, did you have something you wanted to add? Um yeah, yeah, Lucy, I just wanted to, um, good evening, uh, commissioners. Um, thank you for your time on all of this. Um, very good questions. And as Lucy's uh, telling you the schedule, I think our goal is to um, finalize those dates um, this week and hopefully get you get those dates um, on your calendar. Um, but I just wanted to kind of follow up on one of the questions uh, Chair Brennan had about notice uh, board uh, being posted and how close we do it to the hearing versus what if are we doing them early in the in the process so I think as Lucy said we are mailing uh, folks earlier as a notice of application however I think uh, what we've heard what I've heard from the community members is that we're not posting the board until close to the hearing so I think the direction to our staff is to start posting those early even though our code may uh, require it later uh, just so that we get um, the information from the community early in the process so it's not coming as a surprise um, later uh, to adjacent property owners. Um, and of course, we'll clean all of this up in our Title 18 code update, update, but for now, I think we will start posting the boards also at the time we're giving the notice of application. So I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of background on that. and. Uh, and the, the three and then now talking about the title 18 code update i just wanted to kind of make it clear that um, the gaps analysis the discussion draft the hearing draft is what we're calling it as three different series of uh, you know um, to break up the whole uh, process and it will include um, a lot of work on you know there are three meetings that we have uh, jointly with the dc and PPC for the six series total. So this is additional uh, time for you, but I think I understand from Lucy that um, uh, those dates, I think we're trying to match up some of those dates that are actually on your calendar. So the, you know those are reserved, uh, but changing them on PPC's calendar. But we hope to finalize some of those dates and put them on your calendar in the, um, by, by next week. That's all I have to add, Lucy, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question on um, schedule. This is Patty Dillon. Um, so looking at, at this look ahead, it looks like um, you're not anticipating anything else over this summer. Is that correct? I believe so. Um, now, um, there are, as I mentioned, there are two uh, site development permits that are in, and I'm just not sure of the timing of those. Um, the lead time is not quite as much as it is for, um, a, say, a master site plan and site development permit. Um, and uh, I will point out that September 1st, which is our tentative date, is the Wednesday before Labor Day. I was a little surprised when I realized that. So um, it will feel like summer. Um, but it has a September um, date. So uh, we will keep you posted and um, I will uh, check into um, the timing of those other two um, permits just to find out uh, what we know about them because I can appreciate um, we all may actually start traveling this summer and it would be good to know uh, if something's going to be uh, on our schedule. Thanks. You bet. Anything else? Okay. 
I'm going to um, just go through some resources. You've seen this before, um, but I, I'd like to emphasize this because I just want you to know some of the resources that are available to you. On our website, um, the image on the uh, left is our uh, home page. Um, you can always sign up for the Notify Me. Uh, if you click on this, there are different topical um, uh, lists that um, communications use to send things out. And so that's a good way to just know about um, things that are happening in the community. If you're trying to find something on our webpage, uh, the search function I hear is quite good. I know I use it occasionally because I can't remember where something is. Um, so that's another option. Um, You've heard me talk about the active projects map. Um, that This is an example of what that looks like. Um, things that are in orange are in review. Things that are in gray are uh, under construction. And so um, if you are in looking at a, or anticipating a quasi-judicial um, permit review, please don't go look here. Um, but if you're curious about your community or you uh, know, um, want to know what's happening in a neighborhood, for instance, where you live, um, you know, this is a good resource. Um, to get to our code standards plans and the municipal code, um, you would uh, go to our homepage, um, hover over your government, and then click on either uh, of these two. This is what the pages look like. Um, this has all kinds of documents um, that are available on our website. Um, the lower page will take you to our municipal code or IMC. Um, you guys will now be, um, I'm sure, overly well versed in the different titles um, that are in the IMC through your work on um, Title 18. Um, when you, if you do look at our municipal code, um, as I mentioned, it is the land use code is Title 18. It is basically equivalent to every single other title in the um, IMC. So um, quite a bit of material there. These are all the different um, existing chapters. Um, one that you might be interested in is the zoning code. It lists the allowed uses but you can click on any of these and um, see um, uh, you know, what materials are in there. The other point I would make is 1819 is a treasure trove of lots and lots of individualized standards that we are going to pull apart and put in the right place as part of the Title 18 update. But the Old Town standards, the Central Issaquah Standards, the Issaquah Highlands, and Talus Replacement Regulations are all in 1819. So it is chock-a-block with um, information. Uh, and many of those uh, codes and standards that I showed you that you can get to directly from our um, homepage are stored in what is called our Document Center. Um, it used to be available from our homepage. Um, it is still accessible using this um, URL. Um, but if you want, if you're looking for something, you can always um, enter the isquawa.gov slash document center and then expand various sections um, to find uh, the particular thing you're looking for. Um, if you're interested in how long your term lasts, um, you don't have your packet and you're interested in um, accessing it online or you want to find some archived material, again, if you hover from our homepage over your government and go to Boards and Commissions, then click on Development, um, there's an immediate email link to me. Um, you can see this is a little outdated, um, but um, these are uh, were the regular members last year and the alternate members. Um, so, and you can also see your terms. Uh, it lists our regular meeting schedules, um, when and where those are. And as I mentioned, it also has a link to our archive center where you can get to agendas, minutes, and packets. 
and maybe even videoed. And that's um, the end of what I wanted to uh, share with you. Any questions on resources? Um, and by the way, um, those resources, uh, you may remember that last November uh, you all uh, asked um, if I would share the presentation, and I think I forwarded that to you in the last couple of days. Um, so you have much of this information um, in case you need it as a resource to your resources. And um, that's it. Great. Great. Thanks, Lucy. And, and thanks. Um, Ms. Eggers, uh, Mr. Haney, for the information, very helpful, even though for some of us it's a refresher, um, but we always take away something, at least I do, from these, um, these trainings, so really appreciate, appreciate the really well um, put together presentation material, so thanks for that, and as same, um, uh, Lucy, for always the great information that you provide to the commission. So we have a couple of other things on the agenda. I'm not quite sure if we have any uh, more ground to cover here, but reports or updates. I think you kind of just covered most of that. Okay, I uh, covered all of that um, that great. I would have. Thank you. And then we also have on our agenda tonight an opportunity for public comment. And since that was published, I do want to give anybody who is um, attending the meeting, this virtual meeting, uh, that wants to comment this evening, an opportunity to do that. I don't know if we have anybody on the call. We do. Um, uh, Connie Marsh has asked to make public comment, and she has been elevated uh, to be a panelist. Um, Ms. Marsh, feel free to unmute and turn your camera on. Hey, I'm Connie Marsh. I live up on Squawk, and Yes, I have public comment. Thank you for asking. So this is actually the broadest sort of presentation I've seen on the quasi judicial. So I and and all the rest of it. So I appreciate that. But I have a different perspective because I am, you know, in attendance as the public and I am the one trying to negotiate the process that you all are making decisions on. And as many of you know, I'm always trying to, to, to get a little more. So this is, after many years of hearing this and having the questions asked and maybe not answered or contradictory answers, this is my quick but long list. Um, I have heard that you aren't supposed to discuss the quasi-judicial decisions even after the decisions were made. I have heard that in prior meetings. This meeting seemed maybe to be a little bit different on that topic as you can get rid of your notes after your 21 days after the decision. Can you actually then talk about your decision after the decision? And um, the process, as far as I can understand it, can be discussed, just not the substance of it. So, if you answer process questions on like how does this work how do i get to a meeting you can answer those questions and somebody can can contradict me if i'm wrong and i'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the issues that i had because i had the experience of having an appeal and i found that um you the 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 record is not as seamless as one would expect. You would think that that uh, the record would be everything that everybody had sent in, and in my experience during the appeal, that was that it, it, that was not the case. The finding out what people had had presented in letters was awkwardly hard and probably cost me ten thousand dollars. So I would like to ensure that this the what is on the record is very clear and i haven't figured out how to do that so i'm asking the development commission to actually look at the things that are included in the record in the staff reports because it's hard to understand whether the things that are on the active projects list and the active projects map 
are part of the record. And some of the language that seems to be boilerplate does refer to the active projects list and some does not. And it created confusion. And so somewhere, somehow it needs to, there needs to be a line drawn as to what the record is. If we're providing so much information in other places on the website, for example, is that now part of the record? And that was not clarified here. And if Jim Haney is not asleep there, he's gonna remember that pain that we had on that conversation. So um, the, the uh, information is not just for appeals. My understanding it's the information that you provide during this record is actually what they use to implement the project. And I'm gonna use an example of the balconies on the gateway project. I went back and I looked at the photographs of what that gateway project, not gateway senior, but gateway was, was looked like in the pictures that were presented at development commission. And there was like five times the number of balconies and it created a sort of a balanced, coherent effect from the freeway. And right now it looks just sort of weird. There's this periodic balconies peppering the building. And so I asked the question, well, why doesn't the development look like the pictures? And the answer, as I recall it paraphrasing was that there was no reference to those pictures during the development commission. There was no statement or or condition requiring those balconies. So even though they were in the pictures, and sort of that sets the expectation of what's going to occur. It was not implementable by staff because there was not a direct reference for that visual. And I don't know how to make it so that that. Uh, and so is value engineered out. Let me finish it with that. So how do you make it so what you think you're getting is what you actually get? Right, because I think all of you and myself expected those balconies would occur. So every time I drive by the freeway, I grind my teeth on the freeway. I grind my teeth both at the vegetation and at the dang balconies or the the, the surface of the building. I mean, we need to fix that somehow. Um, uh, then let's talk about the consolidated permits a little bit. Uh, the consolidated permit, the staffs seems to use that as de facto. If the applicant asks for a consolidated permit, they seem to just say, okay, we need to give it to them. Now, my read of the code, I'm not a lawyer, it seems like we don't need to just automatically provide that to them, though we do habitually. I think that needs to be a more conscientious decision, and perhaps that could be part of the process. Do we want to allow for a consolidated permit review in a particular situation? Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but there have been some points where you would like to peel it apart from each other. You'd actually like the policy language to get into place before you have to and have a discussion before you actually look at the permitting of, you know, the, the you get it. Um, now, Lucy says you can't go to the active projects list. And that was one of my questions. I don't know why you couldn't if all that stuff is going to be the stuff that's on the record. I don't know why you wouldn't be able to go to the active projects list or map. And while that's a topic of conversation, I would like for all of you to go to those two things and get a, a feeling of how the public has to negotiate the information going into these reviews. Uh, on my phone, it was on incomprehensible using the map. Um, the list is easier. On the computer, it's still hard using the map, but it's at least tolerable. So check it out if you haven't done that before. Um, a feedback loop for development commission to see that the intent of its decision has actually been achieved has never occurred. I would like to see in this situation that you you can see that what you think you're approving actually gets approved and built and that needs to be a habit so that you can see 
on the fly when changes need to be made in how things are working because I, I think that is lacking. And lo and behold, that's the end of my list. So I talked really fast. I don't know if you understood any of it. I know I'm over my five minutes, but I appreciate your patience in going through all of all of this stuff. And I hope that my um, comments give you a little bit of perspective from the public point of view, not the staff point of view and your own point of view. OK, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Marsh. Appreciate the comments and the feedback, too. Is, Lucy, is there anyone else that um, would like to make public comment tonight? There are uh, no other uh, attendees other than our recording secretary. Great. So uh, with that, then I think we have concluded our business for this evening. Uh, any final questions or comments from commissioners? Seeing none, then we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.